Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 212. And as I'm recording this, it is very hard to believe that I have recorded 212 of these introductions because it really does feel every time as if I'm doing it for the first time still. But anyway, this episode is with Deborah Gordon, who is a professor of biology here at Stanford University. And Deborah is a myrmecologist, which though myrmecology sounds like a an esoteric branch of cryptozoology centered on the study of merfolk, it is in fact a branch of entomology centered on ants. And Deborah focuses on how complex ant colony behavior arises when ant colonies themselves have no central control because contrary to their titles, ant colony queens don't actually do any ruling. And in this episode, Deborah and I talk about ants, about some of their distinctive features, some neat species, and what produces their complex behavior. For more of Deborah's work on collective behavior, you should check out her book, The Ecology of Collective Behavior. And then if you're more interested in ant societies, how they're structured, how they work, then her book aptly titled Ants at Work gives more information on just these topics. There is a Patreon for the show a link to which is in the description that you might consider joining if you're interested in a link to an ad-free RSS feed or to show notes. There's also a post up about an AMA that I'm going to be, well, I'm going to be doing monthly AMAs, at least that's my current plan. And the first one will be coming in early July if you'd like to leave a question. Also, Comments, likes, reviews, subscribes, those are always greatly appreciated, especially on Spotify and Apple, where I am battling for that five-star rating. But now, without any further ado, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Deborah. So I am clearly very fascinated by ants, so I don't want you to take this question the wrong way, but most people just think of ants as a nuisance. And this makes me wonder immediately how it was that they came to so grip your interest. I started working on ants when I was a graduate student, and I was interested in developmental biology and the debates around reductionism that went on in developmental biology around the turn of the 20th century, uh, because there was an explicit debate about whether it was possible to understand how an embryo develops by thinking about the um, whether an embryo develops through the um, playing out of the internal instructions of each cell, or whether instead we need to think about the interactions among cells. So it was an example of a general question about systems without central control in nature. Can we understand the causes of what they do by looking just at the parts, or do we have to think about how the parts work together? And I was looking for an example of a system like that without central control, like an embryo, where it's possible to see everything as it happens. Because back then and less so now because we have better imaging, but even now in order to see how an embryo develops, you have to let it develop and then kill it and look at what's happening and then let another one develop a little longer and then kill it. It's very hard to watch development in action as it happens inside an embryo. But in, in an ant colony, you can see a system without central control and you can see all the ants and you can see everything that happens. So I came to think about ants in this very roundabout way through this abstract connection to other systems without central control. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting that questions of complexity, reductionism, emergence, this sort of thing is what brought you 
to ants just because I came to them. And of course, I'm not an expert on ants, but I came to them just from reading E.O. Wilson's uh, books. And I just thought, wow, ants are doing these really amazing things. Yes, mm-hmm. they are. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, before we speak about the some of the emergence, um, what amazing things ants do as colonies. I thought we might just speak a bit about them as insects. So what are some of the general features of ants that distinguish them from other insects, social or otherwise? Well, ants evolved from wasps about 150, 130 million years ago. And there are now about 15,000 living species and they all have in common that they live in colonies consisting of one or more reproductive females that we call the queens, but in fact, all they do is lay the eggs. And then all the ants that you see out walking around are sterile female workers. So what characterizes the ants is that they are very diverse. There are many different species and they live in every conceivable habitat and they're all social in the sense that they all live in colonies. And you said that there are queens who lay all of the eggs, but maybe contrary to the queen metaphor, am I right that queens aren't really ruling the colonies? They're not doling out tasks or anything like that. That's right. They have no authority. They don't tell anybody what to do. And in fact, no ant ever tells another ant what to do. So there are no ants that Um, are directing the behavior of other ants. And you said that the female ants or the workers are all sterile females. What do the male ants do in an ant colony? In most species, the males are only alive very briefly to mate and then they die. So, for example, the harvester ants that I've studied a lot, the queen lives for 20, 30 years And she goes on producing all of the ants in the colony using the sperm that she stored from an original mating session when she was a few weeks old. So she meets males once in her life and then um, never again. She produces males, she produces sons, but she doesn't ever mate again. Well, it's different from honeybees that... um, uh, have a have a different system where the males are around inside the hive. What is the or how related are these sterile female workers to one another? Because I know that ants will sort of sacrifice themselves for one another without. Uh, I mean, this is anthropomorphizing them, but without any second thoughts or anything like that. And my understanding, or at least what I remember from reading the selfish gene a long time ago is that this sort of behavior can be attributed or explained to how genetically close they are to one another. Well, that was Bill Hamilton's insight um, about uh, how it is that worker sterility could evolve, not so much sacrificing themselves for each other, but not reproducing. And his idea was um, based on the strange genetic system of all of the hymenoptera, that's the ants, the bees, and the wasps, where the females are diploid. They have two chromosomes. The males are haploid. So every female has one of her mother's two alleles, but the same one from the father. And that means that in a colony where there's a queen that mates only once, they all have the same father, then the workers are more related to each other than they would be to their own daughters because they all share this one um, haploid, uh, they all share one allele from their haploid father. So that's how the math works out. In fact, though, now that we have the genetic tools to track mating and um, what's actually happening, it seems very unlikely 
that there would ever be an ant queen who made it only once. So in fact, the sisters are not that closely related to each other. And while it was a, a very um, cool idea, it doesn't actually seem to be happening that way in the ants. So they're not that closely related to each other if they have different fathers. The workers are not that closely related to each other if they have different fathers. What we call the patrilines in the in an ant colony would be a patriline is all the workers who have in common both a mother and a father. Well, before we move on to some of the more interesting features of ants, I, you mentioned that ants sort of evolved from wasps, I think maybe, or diverged from wasps 130 to 150 million years ago. And I am wondering more about the the differences or similarities in behavior between ants and wasps, and then some of the other similar insects like, or social or eusocial insects like termites and bees. Well, ants, bees, and wasps are all part of the same branch. Termites are a completely different order. Um, they're more related to cockroaches than to um, ants or bees or wasps. So uh, termites are different. But um, the wasps are have a lot more diverse ways of living together than the ants. So the ants all have the same system with um, some uh, females that are reproducing and a lot that aren't. But there's a whole range of systems among the many species of wasps. Some of them do that. Some of them um, live together in groups where um, all of the females lay eggs and so on. So there's a lot of different uh, wasp versions of um, social behavior. So the ants are actually much more uniform than the wasps. And the same with the bees. So there are, I think, about 20,000 species of bees. And some of them um, have a system very similar to that of the ants with uh, one queen, like the honeybees. Um, the honeybees, of course, are a special case because we have been selecting uh, for particular kinds of behavior in honeybees because they've been used in agriculture for about 10,000 years. So honeybees are a kind of domesticated version of a social insect, but um, still there are many species of bees that live together um, and some reproduce and some don't, whereas um, there are lots of bees that are not really social at all in that sense, and a bee, um, a female bee might live by herself, lay eggs, um, they go off and that's it. They don't all live together. Before, again, before we get to the emergence and the complexity of these colonies. I think it would be fun both for me and for our listeners to hear about some of the amazing varieties and, and behaviors of ants. And before I ask maybe about some of the ones that I find most interesting, I'm curious if you have any particular favorite species of ants. Well, of course, my favorite species are the ones that I know best, uh, like the harvester ants that I work on in the desert. Uh, or the turtle ants, which are um, very different arboreal ants that live in the tropical forest and stay up in the trees. And what is unique about these two species? Well, of the 15,000 species of ants, only about 50 have ever been studied in detail. So there are many thousands of species of ants that somebody has identified as being a unique species, but we know nothing at all about them. So um, we don't really know how to answer the question of what's unique. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> but maybe I should ask then rather, rather than what's unique about harvester and turtle ants, what is it about them that you find so fascinating beyond, of course, the fact that you work on them? Well, it's because I work on them that I know what's fascinating about them. But um, the one of the most interesting things as I've gotten to know more about both species is the contrast, the differences in the way that they operate and the ways that collective behavior evolves differently in different kinds of ecological situations. 
So the harvester ants uh, are living in the desert where, and they eat seeds, which change very slowly. And so they've evolved a system for regulating their behavior, for um, collectively regulating the behavior of the colony that's really different from the turtle ants, which live in the tropical forest where everything changes really quickly. And there's a lot of competition and they have to respond really quickly to um, patchy resources that they, they find and they have to take right away. So one of the things I've been learning by looking at two very different species is how differently ant colonies can go about their business and um, regulate their behavior. Maybe I ought to ask then about some of the ants that I find particularly neat because they're they're more quote unquote flashy ants. So so one species that is cool is um, Dracula ants. I don't know what those are. Uh, Dracula ants are ants that they feed off of the analog of blood of their of their um, they're not pupa, but they're they're infants. Their ants that are growing. Well, if they ate their their larvae, their yeah, their larvae, they can't eat all of them, or there wouldn't be any left. Right. I can try to look up and see what you're talking about because sure. I've never looked at that. I just looked up Dracula ants, and we'll see um, if I find anything. A Dedomerma venatrix from Madagascar. An endangered species of ants. So it looks like a very primitive ant. It doesn't have a um, petiole. It says that they're blind, but most ants are pretty blind. I don't know. Never heard of them. Okay, interesting. Uh, Leaking the blood of its young. Uh, So what does that mean, I wonder? In many species of ants, um, the queens lay eggs, uh, produce eggs that the workers eat, um, called trophic eggs. Mm -hmm. But um, this, uh, on Wikipedia, um, I see Phil Ward. Brian Fisher has worked a lot in Madagascar. Um, But the Wikipedia article only cites the um, taxonomy, but nothing about the eating the the um, hmm. larvae. So I don't know anything about them. Never heard hmm. of them. Are, are you familiar with honeypot ants? Yes, I have even eaten a honeypot ant. Oh, could you? I get you know much more about them than I do. What is the the basic? Honeypot ant? ants are um, the genus is is Myrmecocystis, and they live in the desert. In fact, they're, uh, they live in the same area as the harvester ants that I work on. So I have seen them a lot and, um, they store food in workers. So there are some workers who stay down in the nest and other ants, uh, feed them by regurgitating and they get so fat, their abdomens get so big that they can't really move anymore. And they just cling to the, the, side of the chamber um, and they serve as a storage receptacle for the other ants. But they were well known to the indigenous people of the Southwest desert of the U S because eating it is like eating a little pea sized bowl of honey. Um, And so uh, they would dig them up to eat the, the repletes as they're called. I didn't realize that they were actually sweet. Yeah. And you mentioned a minute ago these trophic eggs that some ant queens lay. And this is another example of what I think is called trophallaxis that is? No, trophallaxis is basically when one ant regurgitates into the mouth of another. Okay. So the the honeypot ants are not an example of trophallaxis. Well, uh Yes. They, oh, that, sorry. That's what I was saying was an example of trophallaxis. I was, guess I was oh, ambiguous. Yes. Yeah. No, but eating trophic eggs, an egg is a discrete object that has come yeah. out of the queen's body and then the other ant eats it. But trophallaxis is the exchange of fluids through the mouth parts. Is 
Trophallaxis, trophic eggs, are these sort of specific cases of just more general ant behavior where they feed one another? Yep. Well, in an ant colony, the um, food that comes into the colony is distributed around the colony. So, yes, they always feed each other. So trophallaxis is a way of um, one ant feeding another liquids. And some ant species eat liquids and some don't. So basically, some ants eat um, other insects. So they basically eat meat. Uh, some ants eat sweet things like nectar from flowers um, or even the sugary excretions of other insects like scale insects. So the ones that some um, insects eat, um, basically fats like seeds, which are sort of like nuts. Uh, and it's the ones that eat nectar. So they're taking in a liquid that have to spread it around by trophallaxis because they've got a liquid in their body and then they're sharing it by um, giving it to another ant. Whereas the ants that eat seeds, they um, share the seeds so they don't do that much trophallaxis. The larvae, you know, most ant larvae, so ant larvae don't have any um, developed mouth parts, so they need to be fed. So many species where the adults don't feed each other, they still use trophallaxis to feed the larvae because the larvae don't have another way of, of eating. Um, but uh, the species that I have worked on most, the harvester ants who eat seeds, I've seen them in the lab. Uh, the ants, the adults take a seed and sort of scratch up the surface and then put it next to the mouth parts of the larvae. So I guess the larvae can actually get something off the seed. You mentioned that some ants eat meat. It has been a long time since I read the Insect Societies, which I think is a, a 1971 book by E.O. Wilson. And I, I've read in, in your work that some of his very important theses at the time, uh, such, a, such as um, ants sort of being in a certain cast for life, have turned out to be false. And this might be something that I read that is not um, correct, or maybe I've just manipulated it. But I recall reading that ants will often take their dead out of the colony, but termites, on the other hand, or at least some species of termites, will eat their dead, so they're necrophagous, because they don't get sufficient protein from the cellulose that they consume, and so they need to recycle the protein within the colony. I'm wondering if ants, since you said some eat meat, whether you know of any that are necrophagous where they'll eat their own dead? Um, I don't. Um, I, uh, I, I've never heard of ants eating dead ants, but there are many known cases of ants getting rid of the dead ants, which might help to prevent disease. I don't know much about the, the termites, but, um, uh, the protein in the termite has to come from somewhere, so they can't just get their proteins from eating each other because some somehow there has to be some intake of protein. And just a, a couple more species of ants that I wanted to ask you about before we move on are um, Malaysian exploding ants. Are you familiar with these? No, what do they do? <laughs> Malaysian exploding ants sort of contain a sort of poison and they can burst to thwart predators. To thwart predators? Or uh, other ant colonies that they're warring with. Huh. The Malaysian exploding ants. Okay. Malaysia and Brunei. Can a, a worker can explode suicidally and aggressively as an ultimate act of defense. An ability it has in common with several other species. Okay. So I see it has these glands and it that have some kind of um, 
poison in them and it can contract so that these glands that are in bags along its body explode. Interesting. And then the, the last that I was going to ask about are leaf cutter ants and then other ants that might quote unquote farm other insects. Well, leafcutter ants uh, farm a fungus. So there are many different species of leafcutter ants, and uh, each one grows a characteristic kind of fungus, which it eats. The fungus has to eat too, so it cuts leaves. They're called leafcutter ants because they take pieces of leaf and they feed them to the fungus, and then they eat the fungus. So um, they're very widespread, especially in South America. Uh, farming insects. Uh, so many species of ants, including the Argentine ants, which are familiar to everybody around uh, the whole California coastline, um, they eat the secretions of scale insects. So scale insects like aphids survive. What they eat is the sugary sap in in plants. So the aphid um puts a basically a needle, a, a proboscis into the plant, and it extracts the sugary liquid that's flowing through the plant that nourishes the plant. And these insects take in so much sugar that they actually excrete a lot of sugar. And mm, there are many species of ants that live off of the excretions of the scale insects, which are politely called honeydew. That's the the sugary excretion of the of the aphids or other kinds of scale insects. And uh, some species of ants actually uh, protect the aphids from other insects that want to eat the aphids. So in that sense, they're farming or, or tending or shepherding the scale insects. Well, the last thing I will ask on this count to flesh out our survey of some of the interesting features of ants is what are some of the most extreme environments or bizarre places in which we can find ants? There are ants everywhere, every terrestrial habitat, uh, except for Antarctica. The ants are everywhere. So the range of habitats is the same as that ants are in is the same as the range of habitats that exist. They're in high places, they're in low places, they're in forests, they're in deserts, they live you know, in in jungles, they live on rocky, barren places. They're everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Well, how? I'll just ask about one. What sorts of ants, or how do ants manage to live in some of the coldest and harshest climates on Earth, other than Antarctica? By staying um, down uh, low and below the snow and huddling together in the winter, and only coming out when it's warm enough. That's a good way of doing it. Yeah. So you mentioned that ants all live in colonies. This is something that, and they all have queens. That's something that unites them all. How vital are pheromones to ant behavior? Most ants can't see, so they operate by smell. So there are two classes of odors that they respond to. One is, uh, the substances that they excrete from their bodies, from different glands in their bodies. Uh, for example, something that's familiar to lots of people is the trail pheromone that many of the invasive ants that you see in your kitchen use trail pheromones um, to recruit opportunistically to resources that show up all of a sudden, like the crusts of your pizza. And those ants uh, and any ants that use trail pheromones have a gland in their abdomen. And um, as they walk along, they put down some of it and it's very volatile. It evaporates quickly. But if another ant comes along before it evaporates, then the other ant will follow it. And that's how they make a trail. So that's an example of a pheromone. And the other kind of chemical that they respond to is not coming from, um, is on the surface of their body. Um, it's basically a waxy uh, layer that helps keep the ant from drying out. And many other species of insects have that too. And those are called cuticular hydrocarbons. And those are the odors that ants use, for example, to 
um, decide whether another ant is a nest mate, belongs to the same colony or not. So those are much more long lasting than pheromones that tend to be very volatile and evaporate quickly, whereas the cuticular hydrocarbons are very long lasting. So they respond to both, both to pheromones and to these um, odors on the surface of the other ant's body. So both types of pheromones are very interesting, but I'm curious about the cuticular hydrocarbons. How is it that and so and you said that ants will use them to distinguish nest mates maybe from from rival colonies and is the smell just or the particular cuticular hydrocarbon that a nest produces to identify itself is that somehow just unique because of the genetic makeup of the ants themselves or are they kind of I guess this is anthropomorphizing too much. Are they sort of like selecting uh, a unique sort of scent to have for their colony? It might have something to do actually with what they eat. Um, so we do know that um, feeding ants something um, uh, extremely unusual will give them unusual cuticular hydrocarbons. So we don't really know um, how they come to be unique, but um, they change. So uh, an, ant, an ant's cuticular hydrocarbon profile changes over time. So the <clears throat> the profile of the colony is sort of drifting along. And it's a really interesting question about whether um, there's some way that it changes in relation to the other ants of other colonies that a particular colony is encountering. And we found for the harvester ants, and we don't really have any idea how this would work, but we found that the, the hydrocarbon profiles of neighboring colonies were more different from each other than the profiles of colonies farther away, suggesting that somehow through contact, they somehow modify their hydrocarbon profile, and we have no idea how that could work. Interesting. Yeah. Just because I would assume that if food were a major factor in the cuticular hydrocarbons that the ants produce and the particular cuticular hydrocarbons are used by the ants to distinguish their nest mates from other nearby colonies, that it wouldn't be the food just because I would assume that colonies of similar species in the same environment would be eating the same things. Right. Well, maybe depending on what they're eating and how that's distributed. So it may not be the same for all species of ants. Um, some, in some species, they don't really seem to um, care very much whether the other ant is a nest mate. So species also differ in how strongly they react or how much they seem to respond to differences in their colony's hydrocarbons and those of the neighbor. And also, species seem to differ in how quickly their own changes. But it seems that the idea that we started with, that the hydrocarbon profile was kind of a passport that was purely genetic and everybody was the same, Definitely isn't true. So definitely the the way an ant smells and also how it responds to the array of odors that it meets clearly changes over time. And one of the things we've noticed in harvester ants, we found in harvester ants is that the ants that are inside the nest tend to smell more like the ants inside the nest of a neighboring colony. And that as they come out and work outside, um, the exposure to the sun changes their hydrocarbon profile. So the chemical reactions that are induced by being outside um, and also perhaps by the, the ant's own response to um, a, a drier environment um, changes its hydrocarbon profile so that an ant of a given colony can distinguish its um, the ants that are working inside the nest from the foragers that are working outside the nest because they smell different. 
And we know about this from experiments where we extract the hydrocarbons off of an ant and we put it on little glass beads and we expose the ants to bees with different smells and we can see that they're reacting to these changes in how an ant smells. So an ant doesn't have the same profile um, its whole lifetime and it's not the case that every ant in the colony smells alike. So it's not really just a single passport. Okay. Um, there's a lot more going on than that. You said that some ants are more and some less sensitive to these odors. And I am wondering whether either the harvester or turtle ants are particularly sensitive to the point that they might be more uh, warlike or bellicose than other ants? Well, the harvester ants definitely detect differences in um, the, the, they definitely detect a difference between the smell of a nest mate and the smell of a non nest mate. And um, I found that they actually recognize the smell of a neighbor. Um, they react more strongly to the smell of a neighbor who they've met many times relative to the smell of some colony far away that they've never met. So they do react but they almost always react by just turning around and going away, not by fighting. So they aren't especially warlike. They do fight sometimes, but it's pretty rare. What do their fights look like when they do happen? Uh, when the harvester ants fight, uh, one ant grabs onto the petiole of another, and it seems to be trying to, to tear it apart. Sorry, the petiole, so an ant comes, like all insects, comes in three parts. It's got a head, an abdomen, and a thorax. And the little bridge between the thorax and the abdomen is called the petiole, a little segment that links um, its, its abdomen to the rest of it. And when they fight, one ant tries to clamp onto the petiole of another, and it seems to be trying to tear it apart. But it usually can't do that. And so they end up kind of rolling around for a long time, and often the ant that's attack, attacking dies from exposure because it spends so long out in the sun um, trying to tear the other ants apart. But its jaw muscles are so strong that they remain attached even when it's dead and the rest of it is broken off. And you can see after a time of fighting which usually happens after the summer rains, you can see some ants walking around with a head clamped on in between <laughs> their thorax and their abdomen because it's their kind of trophy um, uh, because the, the attacker's head never came off. So they only fight in the, sorry, they only fight um, on really humid days, um, maybe because that's the only time that they can afford to be outside the nest so long um, rolling around trying to tear another ant apart. You mentioned earlier that no ant tells another ant what to do. And I think that this is, inter I mean, it's, inter it's interesting for many reasons. But when I was reading the insect societies, one word uh, stuck out at me, and that was dulosis. And it was because I have a rudimentary understanding of ancient Greek, and I knew that dulos means slave in ancient Greek. So when I just saw dulosis, I was so excited that my ancient Greek uh, became useful. But slavery, at least among humans, very explicitly involves one person telling or ordering or forcing another person to do something. And I'm wondering how if no ant tells another ant what to do, ants have something or some species of ants have something akin to slavery. I imagine this is related to odors. Well, it's actually no more of a mystery than how an ant of the same colony knows what to do. But um, to go back to slavery or um, whatever we want to call it, there are species of ants that go and steal the, the larvae and pupae of other colonies of other species. And they bring them back and they rear them inside the nest. And so they work, at, you know, they join the colony and they do things in the colony. So that's what's sometimes called slave making. Although it's really different 
from slave making in the sense that actually being a slave is taking a person who has a um, an identity someplace and and forcing them to work someplace else. Um, <clears throat> the thing about uh, these these odors is that they don't show up until um, an ant is uh, um, an adult. So um, people have done this. You can take um, the brood from any species and put it in another species and they will just be accepted. And that goes back to your question about where the odors come from. Because um, the an ant of another species will take on the odors of the species in which it grew up. <coughs> so they spread it on each other by grooming. Uh, so um, how does the ant then know what to do um, well, it's somehow <coughs> it's it's somehow responding to cues from the um, from the other ants in the same way that an ant of any species responds to the others to decide what to do. So you could say that they have um, uh, rules about how to respond to each other that are similar enough that the ant of the of the so called slave species can function in the other colony. But um, uh, it's not because anybody told them what to do, but an ant of the same species isn't getting told what to do either. So it's actually the same question about any species of ant. How, do, how does an ant know what to do? Yeah, and maybe, I mean, since this is so much of what your work is about, maybe we should uh, now shift toward that. So quite generally, how do individual ant interactions lead to this complex collective behavior of the colony? Well, in all species of ants, it works through local interactions. So no ant is making any global assessment of what needs to be done. You know, no ant is thinking, no, we all need more food or we don't need as much food as we did yesterday or anything like that. Um, they're just using these simple interactions. And um, for some ants, it's the rate of antennal contact because when one ant contacts another, uh, with its antennae, it smells the other ant and it can smell these particular hydrocarbons on the other ant's body. So an ant has some rule like, um, I'm a forager and I'll go out on my next trip if I meet enough ants coming in with food. So the ant isn't thinking about how this is going to affect the overall food supply of the colony or how much food there is out there or anything. It's just using its own rate of interaction to decide what to do. And in the aggregate, that creates the behavior of the colony. Or another kind of interaction like that is the trail pheromone. Um, the ant is walking along, and if it um, reaches a place where the pheromone left by another ant hasn't evaporated yet and it's strong enough, it goes that way. And if it doesn't, it might go another way. So it's not thinking, let's make a trail from here to there. It's just using this local information. But in the aggregate, the colony makes a trail. And this is how ants make their trails up into my apartment and, and take crumbs. That's it. That's it. So I, I, I mentioned this earlier. I, I read in one of your articles that while E.O. You know, Wilson thought in the 70s that an ant's cast and the tasks it carries out are static or determined for life, something like this, in fact, they aren't in that an ant will play different roles in the colony as it ages. And is one, I guess, is it just, it will play different roles as it ages. And then also is it, uh, it, it's roles shift based on the interactions it has. Is that, am I right with this? Yes. So it's been known for a long time that, that an ant's task changes as it ages and um, that's very similar to honeybees. In fact, that's the main thing that we have selected for in honeybees. So in a, a honeybee, um, like most ants, first works inside the nest, and then it goes out to forage. And there's been a lot of selection on honeybees about that transition because you want the honeybees out um, pollinating the crops. So there's been a lot of effort to um, shift honeybees towards less time in the nest and more time out foraging. And um, with ants, that's the same general trend. So the added um, idea is that the ants are, 
can shift what they do in response to interactions with each other, which are also reflecting what's happening outside. So for example, in harvester ants, if there's more food suddenly, then the interactions with foragers can uh, lead ants that were working mostly inside the nest to switch to forage. So they're responding not just, it's not just the passage of time, it's also the way that the situation is changing and how that affects their interactions with each other. Some ants seem to be doing very well, such as the ants in my apartment, with the changing environment that has come from the expansion of human activities. But are there many ants that are negatively affected by human expansion, or are they in general just an exception to the rule that we are not good for the other animal species on Earth? No, there are many ants that are being lost, as um, especially tropical forests are being lost, including those first ants you asked me about, the Dracula ants, which are uh, um, almost extinct. Um, so uh, you're right, there are many species of ants that do well with human disturbance, and those are the ones we tend to see, especially in cities. Um, I don't know where your apartment is. Is it somewhere around here? Yeah, it's in EVGR. Yeah, so those are Argentine ants, and Argentine ants are an invasive species that has spread around the world into Mediterranean climates like the coast of California, Mediterranean coastline. They came from Argentina um, on boats with sugar in the early part of the 20th century. And they've probably been carried all around the world, but they do best in developed areas where there are people and there's a Mediterranean climate. So not just California and the Mediterranean, but also South Africa, Japan, Hawaii. Um, and they do better um, in developed areas, partly because we provide water through our plumbing uh, in the hot, dry part of the year. And also we provide a refuge when it's cold and wet. So we definitely help them. Individual ants, their behaviors change over time. How does a uh colony evolve over time and do colonies last indefinitely once they're established are they just pretty static or constantly growing or how does this work well we don't know much about that for many species but because that means um tracking known colonies over time um, that's something that i've done with harvester ants and so i know a lot about that so a harvester ant colony only lives as long as its queen does, and I think that's characteristic of many species. And a queen can live for 20 to 30 years. But it starts out with just one queen, the founding queen, and she uh, makes her nest after the mating flight in the summer. And about six weeks later, there's the first batch of workers. And by the following summer, there might be a few hundred workers. By the next year, by the time she's two, there could be a thousand. And it goes on growing until the colony is five. And that's when it begins to level off. And then there are about 10 to 12,000 ants and they only live a year. So she has to produce them over and over every year. And so it goes on maybe for another 20, 25 years until eventually the queen dies. And when the queen dies, there's nobody to make more ants. And they don't adopt another queen. So once all the workers have died, the colony has died. So it seems that most colonies have, um, all species have to have a founding stage where a, a newly mated queen starts a new colony. And then it gets larger. And we think that it's likely that in most species, it levels off to some mature size. And um, then when the queen dies, the colony is dead. So there are some species where um, the a, a nest um, where the queen has died, a, another queen can move in and will start the process again. So it's not really the same colony continuing. It's a new colony in the same nest. And some of those can last a very long time, like the redwood ants of Northern Europe. Um, it seems that the same nest can be occupied for decades or even more. Um, but it's not it's not the same colony. Is this bottleneck 
at age five in the harvester ants just caused by you know some limit to the amount of young that the queen can produce in a year? We don't know. We don't know? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And, and we also don't know why the queens eventually die. Um, it could be that they, they just run out of the stored sperm and they can't make any more ants. Um, and then there's not enough ants to keep the whole thing going. Or they could die of old age. We don't know. Now, one of the more complex behaviors in ant colonies, as opposed to specific ants that I know that you have studied, is memory. And how does memory manifest itself in an ant colony or, I mean, in individual ants before we talk about how this might work, what might cause memory or explain the memory? Well, I think it's hard to talk about ant colony memory because we have to decide what you mean by memory. Um, there are some experiments showing that uh, ants trained, uh, uh, ants of one species of a Campanota species trained to go to sugar at one place in a lab arena. Um, if you move, if you take it away and the ants are taken out, they will go back to the same place um, for about five minutes. So maybe those ants can remember a location for five minutes. Or the harvester ants that I work on will go out to the same place. The foragers go to the same place over and over on successive trips. So basically they go in a stream of ants and then they leave the trail at the same place pretty much every time and search around and then bring the food back. So they have to remember where they were on the long enough to get them back to the nest and back out again. Um, so that's a memory um, seems easy to call that memory. Then when you're talking about the memory of the colony, that's a different thing. So if you do something to a colony one day, and uh, I've done this to do some kind of perturbation, and then um, a few days later, it's still acting, it's still acting different as it did in response to the perturbation. Is that, do you want to call that memory? Or could you say that a, a process was set in motion that is persisting over some days, it's not so much that the ants remember something, but they're, they're still reacting. But of course, when you get down to it, if you want to talk about memory, our memory in a brain, you have the same problem. You know, is there a little package in there that is labeled what I had for breakfast yesterday? Or is it that somehow there is some neurophysiological process that makes it possible to call back um, what you ate for breakfast yesterday so um, the closer you get to it, the harder it is, I think, to say what ant colony memory would be. In this second case where you say you introduce some perturbation to the colony and then it will respond the same way at a later time, is this sort of behavior also mediated by something involving scent and, and pheromones? Um, no, these would be, um, for example, some situation where I, um, create a mess that they have to clean up and they recruit extra nest maintenance workers to do it. They make the mess for a few days, but, um, after that, they're still doing nest maintenance work. They're still doing extra nest maintenance work. So, um, you could say, well, the colony remembers that there's going to be a lot of mess. And so they, they keep these nest maintenance workers around. Or you could say that there's some process that got those ants into doing nest maintenance work. And if they're still there, they're easily triggered to do other nest maintenance work, even if the perturbation isn't there. So there isn't any particular ant that's remembering anything, but there is a process in place that acts kind of like memory. Um, I don't think it's it's that helpful to call it memory because as I say, even though we have a pretty clear idea of what it means for us to remember something, that's really something that we do with language, right? We say yesterday I had granola for breakfast. Um, and we don't really know how to explain that either. And um, so it could be not that um, there's some neuron labeled 
yesterday's breakfast that's sitting there waiting to be called back on or something, but instead there's some way, some pathway analogous to the extra nest maintenance workers being around that, that makes it possible to say that the next day. Um, so I don't um, think we have a, enough of a way to explain um, any kind of memory to be very clear about what we would mean by colony memory. In one of the articles you wrote, you mentioned a Finnish myrmecologist who studies a European arboreal sort of ant where these ants will like the cold weather ants that you mentioned earlier they'll spend the winter burrowed with one another deep beneath the snow but then in the spring pairs of ants will emerge and an older ant will show a younger ant the trail to, I don't know, some tree where it used to forage, then that ant will die and the younger ant will sort of maintain this pathway or follow this pathway. And I'm wondering how this sort of uh, memory, though we don't need to call it memory if you don't want to, how this might function when I would just imagine that after an entire season, whatever sorts of trails this ant might have the older ant might have left would have been wiped away, but maybe they're not wiped away. Okay. Well, those are uh, redwood ants um, uh, in the former Garufa group. And it was Reiner Rosengren who showed this. And those are the ants actually that I was just talking about where the nests persist for uh, many, many decades, even though the colonies within them turn over and they make these big nests of uh, mounds of pine needles. And in the winter, the whole thing is covered with snow and they huddle together deep underneath where it's a little bit warmer. And then they come out in the spring so that those ants also only live a year. So it's when they're coming out that the older ants before they die, um, go out with a younger ant and the younger ant adopts that trail. Um, the redwood ants are really unusual in that they can see. And so they may be able to see which way it is to a certain tree. And they are tending scale insects in the trees. So there's a particular tree that is also there for many decades, and it's got its population of scale insects in it. And they um, go back and forth to that tree. So um, it's not clear exactly what the ant has to remember, but maybe it remembers the way, something about the angle of the sun or something. It probably doesn't see specific trees or anything like what we would see but it might remember some visual signal that gets it there uh, without the trails. So um, I think that's fine to call that memory. That's memory of the ant by the ant. The ant is remembering which way to go. So the old ant remembers which way to go. The fascinating thing is how does this actually work? The pairing up of the older ant and the younger ant, how do they find each other and what, how, how that's stimulated and all of that. And, um, but we do know from experiments that we did together that it's very difficult to deflect one of those ants from its, its trail. So you can put out all kinds of wonderful food and they will go, they'll deviate from their trail to get it, but the ants will go right back to the trail that they were on. So they're very, very um, steady about very persistent on the same trail. So, the the colony is remembering because the colony is is using the same trails uh, after um, each cohort of ants dies, but you could say the colony remembers through the memory of the individuals. So that's actually one of the easiest examples to explain. Has your research on ants? I mean, now that we're coming towards the end and coming full circle, has your research on ants? answered any of the questions about embryology that got you interested in ants in the first place? Yes, I've learned a lot about how uh, collective behavior works, and I think there are interesting analogies to how it works in other systems. So um, the question that occupied the 
Driesch and Rue, the embryologists of the um, late 19th and early 20th century, about whether it's possible for uh, a system to work without central control. I think um, my work, but also the work of many others, has definitely answered yes to that question. And that's true for for embryos also, that you don't need to imagine some kind of central controlling force that regulates the whole thing, because we see that it's possible for systems to work just through local interactions among the participants that in the aggregate forms the collective behavior that we see. And are there any particular concrete applications that are either extant now or foreseeable in the future from your work in myrmecology to human society? I think that we can see in the diversity of ant species and how they have evolved in relation to different environments, we certainly see analogies to how a collective behavior can respond to the way that the environment is changing. Um, just some simple analogies, like we see that in situations where um, the environment is very unstable, there have to be ways to respond very quickly. Um, whereas when things are very steady, um, it's possible to use um, ways of organizing collective behavior that are more thorough, but slower. And uh, for example, there's a, um, we all learned a lot about the analogies between um, interaction networks in ants and in people during the pandemic when we had to modify our own behavior to regulate our rate of interaction with other people. Well, Deborah, thank you so much. This has been so fascinating. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about ants and your work on them. Thank you. Thank you.